In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. It's so wonderful to, to be with you all on this day and to have uh, these wonderful presentations so far from uh, Deacon Daniel and uh, Abuna John. And to focus specifically on this um, event, this monumental event, that yes, one life, but through that life, changed um, a whole city, and after that, changed us until today. When the woman at the well looks at our Lord and says to him, why, why are you asking me? I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew, I'm a woman, you're a man. Why are you even speaking to me now? The response is this. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew who, who it was who was saying to you, give me to drink, you would ask for the living water. He wanted to change her life but she had to ask for it. We're reflecting on the revelation that came to this wonderful woman. We're told that uh, when the disciples came and they wondered, who's this woman he's speaking to? The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Now I want to look at this from two perspectives. The first is how do we, in the place of our Lord, inspire someone to the extent that that person leaves all behind and goes and seeks him? And secondly, putting in us, putting ourselves in her situation, how do we then leave all and follow him and do what we need to do for him? So first us. I'm sure we have met, have met thousands of people, if not tens of thousands of people. I wonder through my words, through my actions, through my example, through my embrace, through my approach, I wonder how many of them would have left their water pot behind. I wonder how many of them would have been so affected as to have their lives changed and be empowered not only to overcome the insecurity and alienation of sin, but then to actually go and speak to others about our Lord. I don't know, maybe none, hopefully a few. But why was that so effective? It was effective because our Lord empowered her. You see, the world puts us in molds and we put ourselves in molds. <clears throat> the world says to us, this is all your worth. This is all your worth. And we then sometimes internalize that and say, yes, this is all we're worth. This is all I'm worth. All I'm worth is to come to this well in the middle of the day in heat. So there's no one here, so I can just draw water and go back home. That is my space in life. That is what I do. But our Lord showed her that she was worth so much more. And there was one thing that she didn't know. She didn't know that our Lord specifically went through Samaria for her. Our Lord did that. She didn't know that our Lord had let his disciples go 
and look for food, there was no one with him. They all left him. There are very few scenarios in the New Testament where they all leave our Lord behind. They all left him. He needed this time with her. And that is the beauty of it. And she wasn't even conscious of that. And so even before we start engaging with people, we need to want to put them first. We need to know where they are in our hearts. Am I willing to make that journey? Am I willing to go way out of my way? Am I willing to go into enemy territory? Am I willing to risk, risk my reputation as a Jewish man to sit at a well and speak to a Samaritan woman whom I know is living a sinful life. But then again, the, the incarnation, the whole incarnation was about our Lord making himself of no reputation. The whole incarnation was about our Lord raising us up. And we could quite easily look at this type of this one woman and superimpose the whole account of the incarnation onto her. God takes flesh, comes into enemy territory into this world, leaves everything else, leaves his kingdom and his angels, sits at our well, which is our world, and waits for us to come, and then asks things of us, give me to eat, give me to drink, give me your heart, follow me. Why does he need any of that? It is to lift us all up. So in this one woman, we can see all of us. We can see our humanity. This one woman could embody all the disciples, all the apostles, all the faithful, us, living in our sinfulness, in our brokenness, in our unworthiness. And yet he came for that. And this is what we're called to do. You see, in spreading the word of God, it is not about inside the church or outside the church. It's not about inside the home or outside the home. We are called to be his light all the time, everywhere. And so whoever we meet, we reflect his light. I was out yesterday and it was really cold, but it was sunny. And the sun hit a quite a large window and reflected back. And I was really warm in that space. And everywhere I moved, the sun kept me warm from that angle. And so if we become that mirror that moves around, always reflecting the warmth and light of Christ into the world, I will always give that warmth in my home, in my family, in my community, in my church, in the world. There's no such thing as an internal and external evangelist. An evangelist is an evangelist, a bearer, a bringer, a carrier a sharer of the good news. And if you do that, this is what you, this is what you have everywhere. Just last week, um, earlier this week, actually, we had a funeral for um, an, a, an elderly woman. And as you know, in that funeral, read the gospel of the woman who comes to anoint our Lord and breaks the alabaster flask of fragrant oil. And it goes into the whole house. It doesn't just rest on some people. It didn't rest on just Jew or just Gentile or just man or just woman. Fragrance spreads everywhere. And so if we are going to be fragrant, we are going to be fragrant to the world. 
What then happens is that people get that fragrance and they move by it. And in this case, she was so moved by it that she went and told others and shared the fragrance with them. And they came back and got their own. And undoubtedly, they went and shared again. Because our Lord picks people up, lifts, lifts people, raises people. We see it in this account. We see it in the account of the paralytic. The man by the pool, 38 years, where our Lord goes to him and said, do you want to be made well? And he says, I, I, I don't. I don't. I have no one to take me into the pool. Every time I try, someone goes in before me. Our Lord says to him, get up, take your bed, walk. He says to her, do you want the living water? Do you want water from me? I like not to come back to this, 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 this well again. That's not what I'm saying to you. Listen to me. Listen to me. And he prodded and he went deeper. And so we must continue to go deeper in our message. How do I reach people's hearts, not just their ears? You know, we can all give wonderful accounts and great speeches. But how many of those words, those 5,000, 10,000, 1,000 words, how many of them pierce and go into the heart and cause a transformation? Again, not because they're my words, but because they're words of God filtering through me. One lesson I've learned is to invest in everyone. Share love equally. Give to all. I can't tell you the number of people I've met along the way and shared a little bit of love. I didn't think I was doing anything extraordinary. And yet, years later, you feel that that's made a difference. Maybe I didn't see that person leaving his or her water pot behind but it changed their lives. One very, very quick story. A few years back, I was preaching uh, at an Anglican church on Fleet Street, and it was the week of prayer for Christian unity. And um, as I was speaking there, it was a church, a lot of people there, finished and they had a, a meal in the rectory, so he went in. I just sat and socialized. I remember the days when we used to be able to socialize with each other and you know sit across a table and be friendly. And there was a an Anglican priest sitting to my right, and there was a, a, a an Anglican woman priest sitting opposite me. And I was speaking with them. And it turned out later on that this Anglican woman priest was actually Coptic. Her father was Coptic Orthodox. Her mother was British. She was baptized as a Copt. They'd come back to England for various reasons. She um, had become more attached to the Church of England. And it was a kind conversation. It was absolutely fine. Years later, um, she now comes to the Coptic church with the whole family. God's work is always happening. God's work is always happening. All we need to do is be conduits of that work. So what is my role in having people leave the water pot behind? It is to inspire them. So that they see the love of God in me and realize that that is what they need to do. St. Theodorus of Gaza says, it is God who is merciful and grants everyone 
what he or she needs. Who is building him up or he'll, her her up when he gives them more than they need. And how does he give them more than they need? It's through the abundance of his love. So by God showing her love, he suddenly broke her free of the shackles. She was no longer tied down to that stereotype and that mold. She could go beyond it and be brave enough, first and foremost, to leave the water pot. Who cares about the water pot? Why was I even here? I'm not even thinking about it anymore. And secondly, to go to the men who obviously would have looked at her with incredible disdain. And yet, she must have been so vibrant and so convinced that they actually followed her. Of course, they had to come back and say, well, we didn't really believe because of you, but believe the word, because of the words we ourselves heard. That initially, they followed her. How convincing must she have been? How convincing must her words have been? How much must she have been glowing? And St. John Chrysostom says, such one as this woman, for so kindled by his words, she left her water pot. The purpose for which she came ran into the city, drew all the people to Jesus. And a, most and foremost, she said, come see. She didn't even tell them, come see. When we want to spread the word, we often will think, yeah, come, come look at me. Come listen to me. These pearls of wisdom. Or this um, this um, what 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 people now call humble bragging. You know, I'm 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 not I'm not really good, but of course I'd like you to think I am, but I'm not really good. It's it's not about that at all. It's don't come and see me. I'm still the same. Come and see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? How dare she utter those words? How dare she go to the men and utter those words? And yet she did. What made her do that? She was so filled. She was so incredibly filled with his love that she had to share it and that is what the evangelist does. Shares that love and shares that good news, shares that blessing. Our good news is not ours to keep to ourselves. That would be selfish. We must take it and share it, but how? She didn't go and say, listen, listen to me now, I'm changed, you know what? You looked down at me for years. You didn't respect me. I've met this man who respected me and spoke to me. And now I'm telling you there was none of that. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about who I am, what I've done, how I've lived. Come see this man. This man who spoke to me. So from one side, if we are going to be in the place of Christ, lift people up and make them feel their value. Make them feel that they are not defined by their weakest and darkest moments. But by the light that still shines from within and can never be extinguished. That light within that can never be extinguished. Let people see that light and give them the courage to go and say, come and see him. And then if we're going to be in the place of this woman, this wonderful woman, this inspiring woman, to be able to so engage with him that she was filled. 
Now, don't forget that she did two things before she ran off. One was she sat and she listened. Two, she asked and she spoke and she communicated. So we must give ourselves an opportunity to sit and listen and be filled. This wasn't the first time we've seen this. Yes, she left the water pot. But we know men who were by the Sea of Galilee, Simon, his brother Andrew. And our Lord approaches them and says, come follow me. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. Occupational hazard, people just leave things behind. He has that inspiration. I'm there with a water pot. What water pot? What water pot? I've just been filled. Fish? What net? Who cares about a net anymore? I've been filled. And so on and so forth. And that's not confined to the New Testament. St. Anthony, the great St. Anthony, goes to church and listens to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Leave all you have and follow me. How many times have we heard that Gospel? Yet he took it quite literally. Now, we're not all going to have that reaction, but he did. So we see it across time across centuries where people are so touched that they leave all behind. Even now, contemporary history. Just two weeks ago, we marked the anniversary of the martyrdom of the 21 martyrs in Libya. There is no greater leaving one's pot behind than that in our contemporary history. They went to work to earn money to go back to their families. And yet, they didn't just leave their pot behind, they left their lives. They were given opportunity after opportunity to leave our Lord. And yet they became evangelists. They spoke to the whole world. No one would have thought that these ignorant fishermen would have transformed the world. No one would have thought that this sinful woman would have transformed the world. No one would have thought that these simple laborers would have transformed the world. And yet they did. To be an evangelist can take so many forms, so many shapes. Can become expressed in so many ways. But it all revolves around one thing. Being the revelation of the love of God in the world. Spreading the good news. Understanding that we have been so filled that we must go and do this with others, and yet always pointing to our Lord Jesus Christ. I can't tell you where to do that, except do it everywhere always. Even within our evangelism and outreach ministry, and in, in my own mind, ever since this was just a concept, I've always had this understanding that it must be inward and outward. Someone must look for the lost sheep of Israel. And someone must look for the sheep that are of other folds. And we must look for both. 
God will speak to our hearts differently. There is no right, there is no wrong. One of my favorite verses is Acts 1.8, when our Lord says to the disciples that the Holy Spirit will descend on, on them and they will receive power from on high and they will witness to him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Now, there are two ways of looking at that. One way is to look at it in succession. And one of way is to look at it as you need to do all of them. Now, they were a limited number. So which one it meant to them, we're not sure. But for us, we don't have to have that limitation. For us, we need to make sure we are able to serve Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And we do that together, each according to his or her gift. To be an evangelist is not a credential. It is a calling. It is not to be served. It is to serve. It is not to be the master. It is to be the disciple. Following in the footsteps of the master. It is this woman running into the city and saying, come see this man. Come meet him. Could he be the one? It's really important for us to realize that context is essential and how we speak is essential. Our words must be kind. There is no greater example of evangelism and outreach than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Perfect in his gentleness. Perfect in his strength. Perfect in his kindness. Perfect in calling people to account. Perfect in his generosity. And perfect in looking at each individual as a single individual. They are the footsteps we need to follow in. It's not about the language we use. It's about the language we live. It can't just be something we use. Language is not a tool, neither the spoken nor the lived. It is not just a tool. It is an extension of who we are. It is a manifestation of who we are. It is a manifestation of God's love to us and our love for others and our love for him through others. It's a kindness that we need to project. It's the being a blessing. Our Lord said to his disciples, go into every city, go into every town. Preach. Even those who have rejected you, Tell them the kingdom of God has come near to them. One day, maybe just one day, it'll be effective. The beautiful thing about what we are supposed to do, what we are called to do, is that it's not our work. It's his. We're not asked for outcomes. We're not asked for results, we are asked to be faithful. We are asked to be his fellow workers and he is still in charge. We are asked to be his light that we reflect into the world. We are asked to be selfless as he was selfless. And we're asked to be his hope to the world that needs so much hope. In our current context, we've seen so many lives changed. 
through a pandemic, we've seen things that we would not have imagined. We have seen people move away. We've also seen people move much closer. We've had to be adaptive. We've had to look at ministry differently. We've had to invite people into our space, even if it was online, but still assure them that they are not forgotten. We've had to overcome people's fear and anxiety, vulnerabilities. We've had to be strength to lift people up. We're all called to do that. Because people need it. We've all had to serve differently and respond differently. And by God's grace, in many, many cases, we have. I'm so inspired by so much that I've seen from people on this group, on this call now, and people I've seen all around the world. From our own church and from other churches. And that is what the church is. It is responsiveness. It is flexibility. It is the ability to look at challenges and bring God into the midst of it. It is not just being fixed to my water pot and my regular responsibilities and not be open to God changing me. It is about looking at the world around me and serving the best way I possibly can. And that is by continuing to reflect his light into the world. We've heard so much about this wonderful woman of the well. Her story is inspiring, but it's not really a story. It's an account. It happened. And we must never let it just be ink on paper. We must take this account and to the best of our ability, live it. Allow it to transform us. And through us, allow it to speak to others. You see those three short yet incredibly condensed years of ministry. Have so many examples of what it is that we must do how it is that we must live. This is but one account. So today, as we gather, let us follow in her footsteps. Leave our hearts open to being transformed and restored. To leave our hearts open to being moved to the extent that we can leave our water pots behind. And then, in whichever way God calls us, using whichever words or deeds or situations or scenarios, express to people that there is someone they need to meet, someone who has transformed us, someone who has lifted us up, someone who has liberated us, and someone who awaits them both here and more importantly, in his kingdom. Glory be to God forever.